All right, guys, let's finally understand the Node.js event loop because understanding it is going to bring your expertise to the completely next level. And trust me, I've been there. I was working on a backend service with a performance focus and me knowing all these internals of Node.js definitely made me stand out from all the other developers. So if you want to level up your expertise, definitely make sure to watch this video. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to learn what all these components of the Node.js runtime are doing. We're going to have some exercises and then try to understand why the output likes, looks like this and how the processes are flowing through the Node.js runtime. Now, with that said, if you are front-end developer, there's a really good video by Lydia Holly, and this is probably the best video when it comes to the event loop. So go check it out. You're going to learn how the event loop works and how the web APIs are facilitating all this asynchronous communication. But if you're a backend developer, then you are watching the right video. Now, with that said, we're going to start with the components. So here we have a call stack and call stack is where our functions are being executed. Okay. And we also have something called a heap. And although this is not visualized, heap and the call stack are part of the JavaScript engine. And the heap is play, the place where the variables are being stored. I mean, there are values as well. But the call stack is where the functions are being executed. Now, the next component is the libuv library. And this is native to Node.js. Although if you go to libuv's website, you're going to see that is actually a separate library written in C++, but it was made for Node.js initially. So it has all these asynchronous things that you're used to, like DNS resolution, file system events, thread pool, child processes, and so on. And by the way, go check out my Node.js playlist if you want to learn about these things too. But long story short, libuv lets us communicate with some low level native stuff from our operating system, such as threads, networks, and for example, reading files and writing to files. Now the next component that we have, and by the way, notice that we're going clockwise. So call stack, libuv, and then we have the task queue. And task queue compared to the JavaScript task queue is very different. In JavaScript task queue, we don't have these four different sub queues. All right. So we have a timer queue, IO queue, set immediate and close queue. And then we have the macro task queue, which includes the next queue and promise queue. And then the information flows back to the event loop, or rather, I would say the event loop pulls the information from the task queue and sends them to the call stack. Now, call stack is where the functions are being executed. libuv then takes care of the asynchronous stuff, as we said, and then task queue is where the things are being queued. Now, all of these things have a precedence. So for example, when we are dealing with synchronous stuff, such as console log, console log is not asynchronous. So when the console log is being executed, it's going to end up in the call stack right away. Okay, it's not asynchronous. The event loop doesn't have to do anything. So console log is going to straight into the call stack. And if we have, let's say some kind of a synchronous uh, function that takes 10 seconds, then the call stack or the event loop is going to be blocked because nothing else can be processed for these 10 seconds. That's why it's important not to block the main thread of JavaScript. All right. Now, the next thing, as soon as something asynchronous happens, it goes to the libuv. And then libuv is going to take this asynchronous thing. For example, let's say we have this promise, right? libuv is trying to resolve this promise. So it does, let's say some kind of a network call somewhere. And then our call stack or the event loop is still running. All right, it's it's always spinning and executes all the synchronous stuff. And once we get the answer, for example, it gets resolved to this console log, I'm going to take this guy, you are going to end up in one of these queues before being fetched by the event loop. And the place it's going to end up is well, promises is here. So the promise queue is right here. And by the way, all the set timeouts, set intervals are going to end up in the timer queue. All the file reading and network events are going to end up in the IO queue. The set immediate method that's native to Node.js, just simply set immediate, it has its own queue and close, basically listening to close events has its own queue. And now the 
microtask queue is the one that has precedence to the task queue. So things that end up here are generally going to run before the task queue runs. And next tick has the precedence over the promise. So the next tick queue is going to always run before the promise runs. Understanding the internals of Node.js is obviously going to make you a better developer. But we've all been there where we're writing a feature for the whole week and we can't wait to see this feature in production and we deploy it and suddenly we we'll start seeing alerts in production. At this point, the problem is not only just the code, it's also figuring out who's on call, getting the right people involved, communicating clearly and trying to fix the bug before it actually escalates. And this is where the sponsor of today's video, Incident.io, can actually help us. It's an all-in-one incident management platform built for modern engineering teams, bringing together on-call scheduling, automated incident workflows, Slack native response, integrated status pages, and AI-assisted investigation in one place. With built-in on-call scheduling and intelligent alert routing, the right responders are alerted at the right time, which helps reduce noise and burnout. During an incident, teams can coordinate directly from Slack or Teams, automate steps like opening war rooms and assigning roles, and keep stakeholders informed with clear, consistent status updates. One of the newer components is AI SRE, an AI assistant designed to help triage alerts surface likely root causes, suggest next steps, and draft summaries, helping teams reduce the time from alert to resolution. It's currently in early access, so teams can request a demo to see how it fits into real incident response workflow. And by the way, check out the link in the description to see it in action in one simple video. For teams running systems at scale, Incident.io helps engineering SRE DevOps and support teams respond faster, reduce downtime, and bring structure to situations that are usually chaotic. So if this is something that you or your team can benefit from, make sure to check out incident.io. And don't forget that supporting my sponsors is the best way to support this channel. Okay, and this is also a precedence. The timer queue is always going to run before the IO queue, set immediate queue, and at the end, we always run the close queue. And by the way, if we have something in the timer queue, and at the same time, we have something, let's say in the micro task queue, in the promise queue, the, as soon as the timer queue runs its thing that's in the queue, we always are going to check the micro task queue to see if there's anything dangling here so that we can get rid of it before continuing with the task queue. So to visualize it once again, we have the task queue, so micro task queue is, has the first precedence, then the task queue has the second precedence, and within the micro task queue, this is always gonna run first, this is always gonna run second, and then within the task queue, one, two, three, and four. All right, so this is simple to understand, I hope, and as soon as the event loop actually is responsible for taking these events, and then sending it to the call stack to be executed. So let's say in the example of this promise, or the promise is going to be resolved. So the promise, imagine that it doesn't have the dot then anymore. So the response is simply going to be a console log. So it's here and then the event loop picks this up and finally it's going to send it to the call stack and then it's going to be executed there. Now let's focus on the outcome. So synchronous things are always gonna run first, okay? And by the way, the event loop is not stopping. It's running every millisecond or microsecond. It's always trying to pull something from the test queue or the micro test queue, okay? So the first thing that we're gonna get is console log one. And this is the promise, so this is asynchronous. It's not going to run right away. And this is also process next tick again, something asynchronous. So the synchronous things such as console log or like for loops are always going to run first, okay? This is why in the output, we see the console logs first. And then as we saw the next tick and next tick lives here in a micro task queue is also going to be shown next, although here it is the last one. And only then we're going to have the promise run because it's all about the sequence. If you remember when which queues are executed, you understand the event loop, okay? It's as simple as that. And always keep in mind, synchronous things don't get into the queues. 
they are executed right away. All right, let's take a look at another example and practice a bit. So we have two timeouts, set timeout one and two. We have a read file and we're logging out something at the end. We have the third timeout, we have process next tick and we have console log. So don't look at the output yet. Tell me what is going to run first just by looking at this graph and pause the video if you like. If you did, let's look at the output. So the console log, as always, is going to run first because this is synchronous. It's not asynchronous, even though this is at the very end, right, in our code. The next thing is going to be a micro task. So next tick, as we saw here, it's a micro task. And only after micro task, our normal task queues are going to be executed. And in this case, it's going to be three times the site timeouts and obviously the timeout one, two, three, all have zero millisecond timeouts. So they're going to be executed in a usual order. Doesn't have to be because there is still some randomness in our operating system. But in our case, we assume that they're still executed in the normal order. And the last example I'm going to talk about is the following. So we have a readable stream on close. So we're having some kind of a stream and we're listening to close event. And if we look at our diagram, we have the close queue here. So the close events or whatever's inside the close events, like the callbacks are always going to end up in the close queue. So they're gonna come here, come here, then to the close queue, then being picked up by the event loop and being sent back to the call stack to be executed. Okay, then we have the set timeout. Then we have set immediate. And where is set immediate? Oh, set immediate is here and it's a normal task queue, okay? So then within the set immediate, we have a console log, we have a process next tick, we have a promise, then we have a, another set timeout and then we have a set immediate at the end. Now the output is gonna be the following. We have set timeout one, where is it? It's here because on close is going to come after the timeout. So timeouts are here and close is here. Obviously this has the precedence. So two, three, four. So even if within the same file of code, you have readable stream coming first and set timeout coming second, the set timeout is going to run first and then the close is going to run the second. Okay, this is the presence that we remember. So we have a set timeout, then we have set immediate and the next thing is going to be the set timeout three. Then we have set immediate two. And by the way, set immediate is actually a console log within the set immediate. So set timeout, then set timeout, and then the set immediate because it's in the normal queue and then it's coming after the timeouts. But in set immediate, we have the console log. So it's gonna run first here. And then we have the next tick like this one. And then we have the promise. And as you can see, next tick always runs first and then the promise runs the second. And it's actually in the right order here. And then last but not least, we're going to have this promise resolve, uh, this one, and then set immediate at the very end as well here, set immediate three. Okay, guys, I hope you learned something. I hope this was not too confusing. If you are still confused, just watch the video again and just remember that it's all about the precedence and this is what you need to remember when it comes to event loop. The event loop itself actually does not contain anything tricky. It's just a process that's spinning all the time and picking up the things from the queue and trying to execute them, all right? Okay, guys, make sure to check out our sponsor. This is the best way to support my channel and I'm gonna see you in the next one. Goodbye.